Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On. Transport Canada updated the Aeronautical Information Manual, or AIM, in October of 2021. And it contains interesting updates for sub 250 gram drone owners and for people who add accessories to their drones or fly using third party software. Let's check it out. I like the AIM document. It provides a very readable version of the Canadian Aviation Regulations for Drones and includes really important interpretations of rules that can be difficult to understand otherwise. So I strongly encourage people all the time to read it and to keep up to date with the changes and additions. By the way, they flag updated paragraphs with a blue color so you can quickly spot the changes. There are eight areas of change in the document this time, but there are really two important ones to be aware of. So let's focus on those ones. The first is related to sub 250 gram drones or micro RPAs as Transport Canada likes to call them. So if you own a DJI Mini, Mini 2 or any drone under 250 grams, listen up. In section two, they clearly spell out that if you add stuff to your drone such that it is over 250 grams, well, technically 250 grams and over, then you need to register it. And since drone models under 250 grams aren't listed in the drone management portal, they explain that you should use the kit built option in the registration process to describe the drone. One goofy bit though, it does say and you won't believe this, that if you take off the accessories such that your drone is now under 250 grams, you must head back to that portal and deregister your drone. To me, that's a bit pedantic. <laughs> Anyways, later on in section 3.5.3, they now specify that when conducting a flight review, your drone must be over 250 grams. So now they've officially clarified the whole ambiguity about whether or not you could fly a DJI Mini 2 at a flight review. And it confirms exactly what I said in a video I published back in August. Okay, the second big change in this AIM update is a new section on the impact of modifications to your drone, section 3.4.8. This is crucial to understand if you're an advanced pilot flying in controlled airspace or near people. Recall that in order to fly in those circumstances, you need to be flying a drone that is approved for that kind of operation. What Transport Canada calls an RPAS Safety Assurance Declaration. This declaration is normally made by the manufacturer of the drone, DJI, for example. So, Here's the catch. If you modify your approved drone, you may actually be invalidating that safety assurance declaration, meaning you can only fly basic operations, not advanced. And by modify, they mean a change to the structure of your drone, an electrical change, like say wiring in range extenders, adding an accessory, or using third-party software to control your drone's flight. If any of those modifications have an adverse effect on the safety or airworthiness of your drone, you need to either do your own RPAS safety assurance declaration for the modification, which is really hard, or fly in basic operations only. They then go on to say that it is your responsibility the person doing the modification to determine if the change affects the capabilities of the drone based on an evaluation of the drone's specification. Weight obviously would be one factor to consider. For example, if you're adding, I don't know, an extra camera or an extra sensor to your drone, it needs to be within the payload capacity of the drone. Unfortunately, most consumer drones don't actually have published payload capacities. So you have to infer them from the weight of authorized accessories like prop guards, for example. And if you use third party propellers, you need to figure out if they meet the flight specs for your drone. So be careful. They also specifically call out software changes in this section. Now, 
I have no idea how you would determine if third-party software flight systems adversely affects the safety of your drone. So I would strongly encourage you to research into that. Should you be using a system like, say, like, like Litchi in an advanced operational environment like controlled airspace or within 30 meters of people? This is complicated. They finish off this section with a long story about add-on parachute systems. They basically say that just sticking an approved parachute system on your drone isn't enough to fly over people. It has to be specifically designed for your drone. You have to operate within the limits specified by the manufacturer of the system. And you have to register your RPAS as a drone with that parachute system. Now, there are a number of such systems on the approved list. So check this before you fly. And no, you will not find the G.I. Joe parachute on the list. I checked. So like I said, there are quite a few updates in the October version of the AIM, including more stuff about tethered drones for some reason, and a mention of the new SFOC application guideline document. But these two that I've discussed are the biggies. I just wish they would take some time and change the I am safe checklist. I'm sick of flying my drone only when I'm tired and hungry. Yeah, see, if you answer yes to any of these things on the checklist, you should not fly. Have you had sufficient rest? Do you feel alert? Have you had enough to eat? Yes? Well, you're not fit to fly your drone and could be fined up to $1,000. Come on guys, you fixed most of the other errors in this document. It's time to fix this checklist too. Anyway, that's it, that's all. Take a moment and read through the other changes Transport Canada has made in the RPAS section of the AIM. There's a link to the document in the description below this video. And as always, thanks for watching. Safe and happy flying.